All right, welcome to the third installment of our guided reading of the Republic. We're in book two, part one. We're listening to the LibriVox version of the Benjamin Jowett translation of Plato's Republic. Um, sorry, I'm not doing this one live. I've got some technical difficulties and using a different computer, which is why my headphones are all wavy. So I hope the video doesn't distract from what we're doing here. And hopefully by the uh, next couple of days, I'll have that all figured out. So this is book two, part one. And you're going to hear that introduction by our friend Bob Newfield, who is reading. Book two, part one of The Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfield. With these words I was thinking that I had made an end to the discussion, but the end, in truth, proved only to be a beginning, for Glaucon, who was always the most pugnacious of men, was dissatisfied at Trisimachus's retirement. All right, so let's just remember, um, we left off with uh, Thrasymachus, who had just finished having this dialogue with uh, Socrates, not uh, not to his liking, but Thrasymachus was arguing that uh, justice was the advantage of the stronger, and that uh, that um, no one really wants to be just, but that they do so because they don't want unjust people um, acting on them. Now, Socrates dealt with these uh, these arguments, but we're going to see that. Uh, Glaucon and Adamantius are uh, not having any of it. They want to create this more robust argument and have Socrates uh, argue against that. So this book is actually going to be a lot of that, a lot of that new argument coming to light. And basically they're going to, as Socrates says, polish up the argument like a statue. They're, they're going to make it so uh, watertight that um, it seems impossible to counter and we're going to see how Socrates goes ahead and does that. He wanted to have the battle out. So he said to me, Socrates, do you wish really to persuade us, or only to seem to have persuaded us, that to be just is always better than to be unjust? I should wish really to persuade you, I replied, if I could. Then you certainly have not succeeded. Let me ask you now, how would you arrange goods are there not some which we welcome for their own sakes, and independently of their consequences, as, for example, harmless pleasures and enjoyments, which delight us at the time, although nothing follows from them? I agree in thinking there is such a class, I replied. Is there not also a second class of goods, such as knowledge, sight, or health, which are desirable not only in themselves, but also for their results? Certainly, I said. And would you not recognize a third class, such as gymnastic, and the care of the sick, and the physician's art? Also, the various ways of money-making. These do us good, but we regard them as disagreeable, and no one would choose them for their own sakes, but only for the sake of some reward or result which flows from them. There is, I said, this third class also. All right, so they're designating three classes of goods, and by goods they're saying things that are good for us. Um, the first class is basically stuff that's not, it's trivial, um, maybe like taking a bath, right? It doesn't really do anything for you, but it's pleasurable, it's nice, warm water is nice. Um, there's a second class that it's good and good for you, uh, such as, he uses the example of health and sight, uh, that those things are desirable, we want to have them and they're also really helpful. And then the third class is stuff that's not really desirable, but helpful. So stuff that's maybe hard at the time, but has a good result. And he uses the example of exercise, but we could think of other things like diet and um, anything else that you kind of have to work at, you know, practicing uh, a sport or an instrument, for instance. But why do you ask? Because I want to know in which of the three classes you would place justice. In the highest class, I replied, among those goods which he who would be happy desires both for their own sake and for the sake of their results. So Socrates is arguing that justice is in this highest class, which is uh, good and good for you. And 
and they're going to argue against him. That's not what most people think about justice. Then the many are of another mind. They think the justice is to be reckoned in the troublesome class, among goods which are to be pursued for the sake of rewards and of reputation, but in themselves are disagreeable and rather to be avoided. I know, I said, that this is their manner of thinking, and that this was the thesis which Thrasymachus was maintaining just now, when he censured justice and praised injustice. But I am too stupid to be convinced by him. I wish, he said, that you should hear me as well as him, and then I shall see whether you and I agree. For Trasimachus seems to me like a snake to have been charmed by your voice sooner than he ought to have been. But to my mind the nature of justice and injustice have not yet been made clear. Setting aside their rewards and results, I want to know what they are in themselves, and how they inwardly work in the soul. So this is sort of the beginning of that definition that we're looking for. Um, this will be part of what the rest of the book kind of is working at, trying to get this definition, what they are in themselves. And, um, yeah. If you please, then, I will revive the argument of Trasimachus, and first I will speak of the nature and origin of justice according to the common view of them. The common view would just be basically what the Irish person would think about justice. Secondly, I will show that all men who practice justice do so against their will, of necessity, but not as a good. This is sort of actually the, the, the earliest forms of the social contract, uh, which is fleshed out a lot by Hobbes later, but basically the idea is that uh, people are only really doing good because they don't want people to do bad to them. So they say, okay, uh, even though I get the most benefit from doing evil or injustice, I know that uh, people will probably not like that, and they'll, they'll try to stop me. So it's best if we all just do good, even though it's less favorable for all of us. Well, less favorable for me, um, I, I think. That's, uh, yeah, that's the idea. And thirdly, I will argue that there is reason in this view. For the life of the unjust is, after all, better far than the life of the just, if what they say is true, Socrates, since I myself am not of their opinion. But still, I acknowledge that I am perplexed when I hear the voices of Trasimachus and myriads of others dinning in my ears, and, on the other hand, I have never yet heard the superiority of justice to injustice maintained by any one in a satisfactory way. I want to hear justice praised in respect of itself. Then I shall be satisfied, and you are the person from whom I think that I am most likely to hear this, and therefore I will praise the unjust life to the utmost of my power, and my manner of speaking will indicate the manner in which I desire to hear you too praising justice and censuring injustice. Will you say whether you approve of my proposal? Indeed, I do, nor can I imagine any theme about which a man of sense would oftener wish to converse. I am delighted, he replied, to hear you say so, and shall begin by speaking, as I proposed, of the nature and origin of justice. They say that to do injustice is by nature good, to suffer injustice evil, but that the evil is greater than the good. And so it's it's um, evil to suffer injustice is what they're saying, um, and that to do it is good. So if you think about this kind of scale, it's it's good to do bad things and get uh, you know the reward of, of injustice, uh, stealing, cheating, lying, that sort of thing. But when people do that to us, it's bad. So what they're saying is it's actually. Um, if there's a worse thing, it's actually worse to suffer injustice. So basically, it's like, well, why, why do it at all? If, if we don't want it to happen to us, then we probably ought not do it. And so, when men have both done and suffered injustice, and have had experience of both, not being able to avoid the one and obtain the other, they think that they had better agree among themselves to have neither. That's Hence, there arise laws and mutual covenants, 
and that which is ordained by law is termed by them lawful and just. Thus they affirm to be the origin and nature of justice. It is a mean or compromise between the best of all, which is to do injustice and not be punished, and the worst of all, which is to suffer injustice without the power of retaliation. And justice, being at a middle point between the two, is tolerated not as a good, but as the lesser evil, and honoured by reason of the inability of men to do injustice. For no man who is worthy to be called a man would ever submit to such an agreement if he were able to resist. He would be mad if he did. Such is the received account, Socrates, of the nature and origin of justice. All right, um, so he's basically saying that if someone had the power to do whatever he wanted, why would he follow the rules? Um, that's the argument, at least. And now we're going to be getting into the parable or the myth of the Ring of Gyges, which is explaining this point. Um, a bit on the Ring of Gyges. Uh, first of all, uh, if you search on our channel, there is a video specifically on the Ring of Gyges if you want a little more. But uh, this is basically the idea of some guy that gets this ring, gives him a lot of power, sort of like the Lord of the Rings. And, um, and um, in doing so, he does a lot of bad stuff because he's not going to get caught. And now uh, the argument is that uh, basically Glaucon is saying this sort of person would be dumb not to do all the bad stuff because he has no risk of punishment. Now that those who practice justice do so involuntarily, and because they have not the power to be unjust, will best appear if we imagine something of this kind. Having given both to the just and the unjust power to do what they will, let us watch and see whither desire will lead them. Then we shall discover in the very act the just and unjust man to be proceeding along the same road, following their interests, which all natures deem to be their good, and are only diverted into the path of justice by the force of law. The liberty which we are supposing may be most completely given to them in the form of such a power as is said to have been possessed by Gyges, the ancestor of Croesus, the Lydian. According to the tradition, Gyges was a shepherd in the service of the king of Lydia. There was a great storm, and an earthquake made an opening in the earth at the place where he was feeding his flock. Amazed at the sight, he descended into the opening, where, among other marvels, he beheld a hollow brazen horse, having doors, at which he, stooping and looking in, saw a dead body of stature, as appeared to him, more than human, and having nothing on but a gold ring. This he took from the finger of the dead, and reascended. Now the shepherds met together, according to custom, that they might send their monthly report about the flocks to the king. Into their assembly he came, having the ring on his finger, and as he was sitting among them, he chanced to turn the collet of the ring inside his hand, when instantly he became invisible to the rest of the company. So a ring that makes you invisible, that does have some Lord of the Rings feel to it, doesn't it? and they began to speak of him as if he were no longer present. He was astonished at this, and again, touching the ring, he turned the collet outwards and reappeared. He made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result. When he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible, when outwards he reappeared. Whereupon he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court, Whereas, soon as he arrived, he seduced the queen, and with her help conspired against the king, and slew him, and took the kingdom. Suppose now that there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one of them, and the unjust the other. No man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own, when he could safely take what he liked out of the market or go into houses and lie with any one at his pleasure, or kill or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects be like God among men. So the question is, if the just person got this ring that made you invisible, what would he do with it? Would he just, you know, not do anything wrong? Would he stay uh, just and not gain the benefits that you would get from a ring like this? And uh, the argument that Glaucon is making is that he wouldn't. 
then the actions of the just would be as the actions of the unjust they would both come at last to the same point and this we may truly affirm to be a great proof that a man is just not willingly or because he thinks that justice is any good to him individually but of necessity for wherever any one thinks that he can safely be unjust there he is unjust for all men believe in their hearts that injustice is far more profitable to the individual than justice and i feel like at a micro level this is this is sort of true right like if we um you know if you get to a stop sign and there's like no one around you just go right through the stop sign because you're not afraid of getting in trouble um whereas if you get to the stop sign there's a police car right on the side of the road you're probably not going to go through it so there is this sense in which um when you have this this chance of getting in trouble for doing for doing the wrong thing you're less likely to do it and he who argues as i have been supposing will say that they are right if you could imagine any one obtaining this power of becoming invisible and never doing any wrong or touching what was another's he would be thought by the lookers-on to be a most wretched idiot although they would praise him to one another's faces and keep up appearances with one another from a fear that they too might suffer injustice enough of this now if we are to form a real judgment of the life of the just and unjust we must isolate them there is no other way and how is the isolation to be effected i answer let the unjust man be entirely unjust and the just man entirely just nothing is to be taken away from either of them and both are to be perfectly furnished for the work of their respective lives first let the unjust be like other distinguished masters of craft all right so here just like they were talking about the doctor uh, in the end of book one they're talking about the unjust and the just person in an ideal sense so they're not talking like here they're not going to make any mistakes so the unjust person isn't going to be doing something like you know uh, that's going to get him put in jail for instance or get him found out um and that's important because the consequences that are related to the unjust actions are part of the things that they're going to be arguing about like the skillful pilot or physician who knows intuitively his own powers and keeps within their limits and who if he fails at any point is able to recover himself so let the unjust make his unjust attempts in the right way and lie hidden if he means to be great in his injustice he who is found out is nobody for the highest reach of injustice is to be deemed just when you are not therefore i say that in the perfectly unjust man we must assume the most perfect injustice there is to be no deduction but we must allow him while doing the most unjust acts to have acquitted the greatest reputation for justice so the unjust person is so good at hiding his evil deeds that people think he's really awesome they think he's just and fair and good and that sort of thing if he have taken a false step he must be able to recover himself he must be one who can speak with effect if any of his deeds come to light and who can force his way where force is required by his courage and strength and command of money and friends and at his side let us place the just man in his nobleness and simplicity wishing as aeschylus says to be and not to seem good there must be no seeming for if he seem to be just he will be honored and rewarded and then we shall not know whether he is just for the sake of justice or for the sake of honors and rewards so here as they're po as they're painting these pictures or creating these statues as socrates says of this just man the unjust man basically what you have to know is that the unjust guy has all the good stuff he has all the rewards of injustice and he also has the reputation of being just whereas the just man has nothing nothing but justice people think he's the worst he has a bad reputation um he can expect nothing really good besides justice and the question for socrates is you know who is it better to be therefore let him be clothed in justice only and have no other covering and he must be imagined in a state of life the opposite of the former let him be the best of men and let him be thought the worst then he will have been put to the proof and we shall see whether he will be affected by the fear of infamy and its consequences and let him continue thus to the hour of death being just and seeming to be unjust 
when both have reached the utmost extreme, the one of justice and the other of injustice, let judgment be given which of them is the happier of the two. Heavens, my dear Glaucon, I said, how energetically you polish them up for the decision, first one, then the other, as if they were two statues. I do my best, he said. And now that we know what they are like, there is no difficulty in tracing out the sort of life which awaits either of them. This I will proceed to describe. But as you may think the description a little too coarse, I ask you to suppose, Socrates, that the words which follow are not mine. Let me put them into the mouths of the eulogists of injustice. They will tell you that the just man who is thought unjust will be scourged, racked, bound, will have his eyes burnt out, and at last, after suffering every kind of evil, he will be impaled. Then he will understand that he ought to seem only and not to be just. The words of Aeschylus may be more truly spoken of the unjust than of the just, for the unjust is pursuing a reality. He does not live with a view to appearance. He wants to be really unjust, and not to seem only. His mind has a soil, deep and fertile, out of which spring his prudent counsels. In the first place, he is thought just, and therefore bears rule in the city. He can marry whom he will, and give in marriage to whom he will. Also he can trade, and deal where he likes. This is now talking about the unjust person who is getting a rather good life because of his prominent and successful injustice. And always to his own advantage, because he has no misgivings about injustice. And at every contest, whether in public or private, he gets the better of his antagonists, and gains at their expense, and he is rich, and out of his gains he can benefit his friends and harm his enemies. Moreover, he can offer sacrifices and dedicate gifts to the gods abundantly and magnificently, and can honor the gods or any man whom he wants to honor in a far better style than the just, and therefore he is likely to be dearer than they are to the gods. And thus, Socrates, gods, and men are said to unite in making the life of the unjust better than the life of the just. I was going to say something in answer to Glaucon, when Adamantus, his brother, interposed. Socrates, he said, do you not suppose that there is nothing more to be urged? Why, what else is there? I answered. Oh, the strongest point of all has not even been mentioned, he replied. Well, then, according to the proverb, let brother help brother. If he fails in any part, do you assist him? Although I must confess that Glaucon has already said quite enough to lay me in the dust, and take from me the power of helping justice. So here, um, uh, Adamantus is just going to mention, uh, for a little while actually, they're going to talk about how uh, the gods are related to this, and how basically if, you know, if at the end of your life you're going to be uh, in hell, or Hades, or whatever, then even if you have a bad life now, as a just person, it's still better. So they're, they're going to take that into account. They're also going to take into account the fact that the gods, uh, as we understand them from the epic poems, from Homer particularly, are, are prone to blessing people that they like. So this is going to be part of Plato's deconstruction of the uh, gods of the epic poems of Homer. And uh, so keep that in mind that not only are they talking about justice and injustice here, but they're talking about the gods, and they're also talking about what the Greeks know about the gods based on Homer and how that's going to shift by the end of the book. Nonsense, he replied. But let me add something more. There is another side to Glaucon's argument about the praise and censure of justice and injustice, which is equally required in order to bring out what I believe to be his meaning. Parents and tutors are always telling their sons and their wards that they are to be just. But why? Not for the sake of justice, but for the sake of character and reputation, in the hope of obtaining for him who is reputed just some of these offices, marriages, and the like which Glaucon has enumerated among the advantages accruing to the unjust from the reputation of justice. More, however, is made of appearances by this class of persons than by the others. 
for they throw in the good opinion of the gods, and will tell you of a shower of benefits which the heavens, as they say, rain upon the pious. And this accords with the testimony of the noble Hesiod and Homer, the first of whom says that the gods make the oaks of the just to bear acorns at their summit and bees in the middle, and the sheep are bowed down with the weight of their fleeces, and many other blessings of a like kind are provided for them. And Homer has a very similar strain, for he speaks of one whose fame is as the fame of some blameless king, who, like a god, maintains justice, to whom the black earth brings forth wheat and barley, whose trees are bound with fruit, and his sheep never fail to bear, and the sea gives him fish. So if the gods have anything to say about it, the just person is going to benefit from his justice. So their argument is going to be basically uh, refuting this and saying that the just person isn't going to get these benefits in, in this case, and the unjust person will because the unjust person seems to be just. Not only that, but he's actually able to, he has more resources to sacrifice and propitiate the gods. Still grander are the gifts of heaven which Musaeus and his son vouchsafe to the just. They take them down into the world below, where they have the saints lying on couches at a feast, everlastingly drunk, crowned with garlands. Their idea seems to be that an immortality of drunkness is the highest meed of virtue. Some extend their rewards yet further. The posterity, as they say, of the faithful and just shall survive to the third and fourth generation. This is the style in which they praise justice. But about the wicked there is another strain. They bury them in a slough at Hades, and make them carry water in a sieve. Also, while they are yet living, they bring them to infamy, and inflict upon them the punishments which Glaucon described as the portion of the just who are reputed to be unjust. Nothing else does their invention supply. Such is the manner of praising the one and censuring the other. Once more, Socrates, I will ask you to consider another way of speaking about justice and injustice, which is not confined to the poets, but is found in prose writers. The universal voice of mankind is always declaring that justice and virtue are honorable, but grievous and toilsome, and that the pleasures of vice and injustice are easy of attainment, and are only censured by law and opinion. They say also that honesty is for the most part less profitable than dishonesty, and they are quite ready to call wicked men happy, and to honor them both in public and private when they are rich, or in any other way influential while they despise and overlook those who may be weak and poor, even though acknowledging them to be better than the others. But most extraordinary of all is their mode of speaking about virtue and the gods. They say that the gods apportion calamity and misery to many good men, and good and happiness to the wicked. The mendicant prophets go to rich men's doors and persuade them that they have a power committed to them by the gods of making an atonement for man's own or his ancestors' sins by sacrifices or charms, with rejoicings and feasts. And they promise to harm an enemy, whether just or unjust, at a small cost, with magic arts and incantations binding heaven, as they say, to execute their will. And the poets are the authorities to whom they appeal, now smoothing the path of vice with the words of Hesiod. So they're saying that there are ways to make the gods happy with you, and you can still be bad. You can use, you know, these soothsayers or sacrifices and uh, kind of get around that problem of the gods. Vice may be had in abundance without trouble. The way is smooth, and her dwelling place is near. But before virtue the gods have set toil, and a tedious and uphill road. Then, citing Homer as a witness that the gods may be influenced by men, for he also says, The gods too may be turned from their purpose, and men pray to them and avert their wrath by sacrifices and soothing entreaties, and by libations and the odor of fat when they have sinned and transgressed. And they produce a host of books written by Musaeus and Orpheus, who were children of the moon and the muses, that is what they say, according to which they perform their ritual, and persuade not only individuals, but whole cities, 
that expiations and atonements for sin may be made by sacrifices and amusements which fill a vacant hour and are equally at the service of the living and the dead the latter sort they call mysteries and they redeem us from the pains of hell but if we neglect them no one knows what awaits us he proceeded and now when the young hear all this said about virtue and vice and the way in which gods and men regard them how are their minds likely to be affected my dear socrates those of them i mean who are quick-witted and like bees on the wing light on every flower and from all that they hear are prone to draw conclusions as to what manner of persons they should be and in what way they should walk if they would make the best of life probably the youth will say to himself in the words of pindar can i by justice or by crooked ways of deceit ascend a loftier tower which may be a fortress to me all my days for what men say is that if i am really just and not also thought just profit there is none but the pain and loss on the other hand are unmistakable but if though unjust i acquire the reputation of justice a heavenly life is promised to me since then as philosophers prove appearance tyrannizes over truth and is lord of happiness to appearance i must devote myself i will describe around me a picture and shadow of virtue to be the vestibule and exterior of my house behind i will trail the subtle and crafty fox as archilochus greatest of sages recommends but i hear some one exclaiming that the concealment of wickedness is often difficult to which i answer nothing great is easy nevertheless the argument indicates this if we would be happy to be the path along which we should proceed with a view to concealment we will establish secret brotherhoods and political clubs and there are professors of rhetoric who teach the art of persuading courts and assemblies and so partly by persuasion and partly by force i shall make unlawful gains and not be punished so this is the explanation of the person that's going to be doing these unjust things they're going to seem to be good but they're really going to just do whatever they whatever they want whatever they feel is best and typically that's going to be unjust things and they're going to get away with it because they're going to have lofty rhetoric they're going to have assemblies of people who are going to protect them they're going to be taking advantage of all the things that society and government and uh you know money has religion all of these things are going to be kind of shielding them from the consequences of their injustice and really i mean just as an aside this this has a, a lot of implications uh as to you know the people who are in power generally right the people who have power are probably typically this way you know they appear they appear to be good and just but um, looks like uh, they're likely using these systems to do the unjust stuff that they want to do because they have power and they have the ability to do that still i hear a voice saying that the gods cannot be deceived neither can they be compelled but what if there are no gods or suppose them to have no care of human things why in either case should i mind about concealment and even if there are gods and they do care about us what yet we know of them only from tradition and the genealogies of the poets and these are the very persons who say that they may be influenced and turned by sacrifices and soothing entreaties and by offerings let us be consistent then and believe both or neither if the poets speak truly why then we had better be unjust and offer the fruits of injustice for if we are just although we may escape the vengeance of heaven we shall lose the gains of injustice but if we are unjust we shall keep the gains and by our sinning and praying and praying and sinning the gods will be propitiated and we shall not be punished but there is a world below in which either we or our posterity will suffer for unjust deeds yes my friend will be the reflection but there are mysteries and atoning deities and these have great power this is what mighty cities declare and the children of the gods who were their poets and prophets bear a like testimony 
on what principle then shall we any longer choose justice rather than the worst injustice when if we only unite the latter with a deceitful regard to appearances we shall fare to our mind both with gods and men in life and after death as the most numerous and the highest authorities tell us knowing all this socrates how can a man who has any superiority of mind or person or rank or wealth be willing to honour justice or indeed to refrain from laughing when he hears justice praised and even if there should be some one who is able to disprove the truth of my words and who is satisfied that justice is best still he is not angry with the unjust but is very ready to forgive them because he also knows that men are not just of their own free will unless peradventure there be some one whom the divinity within him may have inspired with a hatred of injustice or who has attained knowledge of the truth but no other man he only blames injustice who owing to cowardice or age or some weakness has not the power of being unjust and this is proved by the fact that when he obtains the power he immediately becomes unjust as far as he can be the cause of all this socrates was indicated by us at the beginning of the argument but my brother and i told you how astonished we were to find that all of the professing panegyrists of justice beginning with the ancient heroes of whom any memorial has been preserved to us and ending with the men of our own time no one has ever blamed injustice or praised justice except with a view to the glories honors and benefits which flow from them so this is significant um they're arguing that no one has ever said oh justice is good for its own sake they'll say that justice is good because the just people get uh glories and honors and benefits and those so they're asking socrates to defend justice not using those terms but explaining how it's good uh on its own uh, for its own sake no one has ever adequately described either in verse or prose the true essential nature of either of them abiding in the soul and invisible to any human or divine eye or shown that of all the things of a man's soul which he has within him justice is the greatest good and injustice the greatest evil had this been the universal strain had you sought to persuade us of this from our youth upwards we should not have been on the watch to keep one another from doing wrong but every one would have been his own watchman because afraid if he did wrong of harboring in himself the greatest of evils i dare say that trasimachus and others would seriously hold the language which i have been merely repeating and words even stronger than these about justice and injustice grossly as i conceive perverting their true nature but i speak in this vehement manner as i must frankly confess to you because i want to hear from you the opposite side so just be aware i should have probably said this at the beginning uh, glaucon and adamantius do not believe what they're saying they're they're speaking out of the mouths of someone who might be making these arguments but they're not um personally convinced by them but they also don't know why they're not convinced and that's why they're asking socrates and i would ask you to show not only the superiority which justice has over injustice but what effect they have on the possessor of them which makes the one to be a good and the other an evil to him and please as glaucon requested of you to exclude reputations for unless you take away from each of them his true reputation and add on the false we shall say that you do not praise justice but the appearance of it we shall think that you are only exhorting us to keep injustice dark and that you really agree with trasimachus in thinking that justice is another's good and the interest of the stronger and that injustice is a man's own profit and interest though injurious to the weaker now as you have admitted that justice is one of that highest class of goods which are desired indeed for their results but in a far greater degree for their own sakes like sight or hearing or knowledge or health or any other real and natural and not merely conventional good i would ask you in your praise of justice to regard one point only i mean the essential good and evil which justice and injustice work in the possessors of them let us praise justice and censor injustice magnifying the rewards and honors of the one and abusing the other 
that is a manner of arguing which coming from them i am ready to tolerate but from you who have spent your whole life in the consideration of this question unless i hear the contrary from your own lips i expect something better and therefore i say not only prove to us that justice is better than injustice but show what they either of them do to the possessor of them which makes the one to be a good and the other an evil whether seen or unseen by gods and men so this is the uh, the gauntlet being thrown down socrates has not to, to prove that justice is beneficial or helpful or it gives you honor or anything like that uh, he has to prove that it is good for its own sake and um, he has to show what it does so show what justice does for the just person and what injustice does for the unjust person and disregard what other uh, external factors such as the gods might bring into the picture i have always admired the genius of glaucon and adamantis but on hearing these words i was quite delighted and said sons of an illustrious father that was not a bad beginning of the elegiac verses which the admirer of glaucon made in honor of you after you had distinguished yourselves at the battle of megara sons of ariston he sang divine offspring of an illustrious hero the epithet is very appropriate for there is something truly divine in being able to argue as you have done for the superiority of injustice and remaining unconvinced by your own arguments and i do believe that you are not convinced this i infer from your general character for had i judged you only from your speeches i should have mistrusted you but now the greater my confidence in you the greater is my difficulty in knowing what to say for i am in a strait between two on the one hand i feel that i am unequal to the task and my inability is brought home to me by the fact that you were not satisfied with the answer which i made to trasimachus proving as i thought the superiority which justice has over injustice and yet i cannot refuse to help while breath and speech remain to me i am afraid that there would be an impiety in being present when justice is evil spoken of and not lifting up a hand in her defence and therefore i had best give such help as i can glaucon and the rest entreated me by all means not to let the question drop but to proceed in the investigation they wanted to arrive at the truth first about the nature of justice and injustice and secondly about their relative advantages i told them what i really thought that the enquiry would be of a serious nature and would require very good eyes seeing the all right so here is the beginning of the scheme of the, of the plan that they have to try to figure out what justice is and then how it affects the person and they're basically arguing that um to look at justice on an interpersonal level is kind of like looking at really small and far away so they suppose that if you look at justice in the context of a city or in the context of a society it'll be a lot easier so they're gonna they're going to do that that is the republic they're building this um, imaginary republic to understand how justice functions in that republic and the image they're going to use is like if you're trying to read some words and they're really far away um, it's better to have the words be really large than uh, than, than small so large being the city small being the individual and that's what we're going to get um, going here for us then i said that we are no great wits i think that we had better adopt a method which i may illustrate thus suppose that a short-sighted person had been asked by someone to read small letters from a distance and it occurred to someone else that they might be found in another place which was larger and in which the letters were larger if they were the same and he could read the larger letters first then proceed to the lesser this would have been thought a rare piece of good fortune very true said adamantus but how does the illustration apply to our inquiry i will tell you i replied justice which is the subject of our inquiry is as you know sometimes spoken of as a virtue of an individual and sometimes as the virtue of a state true he replied and is not a state larger than an individual it is 
then in the larger the quantity of justice is likely to be larger and more easily discernible i propose therefore that we inquire into the nature of justice and injustice first as they appear in the state and secondly in the individual proceeding from the greater to the lesser and comparing them that he said is an excellent proposal and if we imagine the state in process of creation we shall see the justice and injustice of the state in process of creation also when they say process of creation they just mean as they think about the state coming to being they're going to form this hypothetical state from the beginning and they're going to try and figure out where justice and injustice come in i dare say when the state is completed there may be a hope that the object of our search will be more easily discovered yes far more easily but ought we to attempt to construct one i said for to do so as i am inclined to think will be a very serious task reflect therefore i have reflected said Anamantis, and i am anxious that you should proceed a state i said arises as i conceive out of the needs of mankind no one is self-sufficing but all of us have many wants can any other origin of a state be imagined there can be no other then as we have many wants and many persons are needed to supply them one takes a helper for one purpose and another for another and when these partners and helpers are gathered together in one habitation the body of inhabitants is termed a state so he's saying the state um, arises from the fact that people need each other to supply their needs true he said and they exchange with one another and one gives and another receives under the idea that exchange will be for their good very true then i said let us begin and create in idea a state and yet the true creator is necessity who is the mother of our invention of course he replied now the first and greatest of necessities is food which is the condition of life and existence certainly the second is a dwelling, and the third clothing, and the like. True. And uh, Pay attention here, because it's going to be a concept that comes up throughout the rest of the book. Uh, this question as to whether one man should be doing one thing, or one man should be doing a whole bunch of things. Um, in the context of the state here, this is like, you know, should one person be making the food, and also building the tools that he needs to grow his food, and also milling the food and turning it into bread like should one person be doing all those things or should there be a division of labor and one person is good at one thing now let us see how our city will be able to supply the great demand we may suppose that one man is a husbandman another a builder someone else a weaver shall we add to them a shoemaker or perhaps some other purveyor to our bodily ones quite right the barest notion of a state must include four or five men clearly and how will they proceed will each bring the result of his labors into a common stock the individual husbandman for example producing for four and laboring four times as long and as much as he need in the provision of food with which he supplies others as well as himself or will he have nothing to do with others and not be at the trouble of producing for them but provide for himself alone a fourth of the food in a fourth of the time and in the remaining three-fourths of his time be employed in making a house or a coat or a pair of shoes having no partnership with others but supplying himself all his own ones adamantus thought that he should aim at producing food only and not at producing everything probably i replied that would be the better way and when i hear you say this i am myself reminded that we are not all alike there are diversities of natures among us which are adapted to different occupations very true and will you have a work better done when the workman has many occupations or when he has only one well, when he has only one further there can be no doubt that a work is spoilt when not done at the right time no doubt for business is not disposed to wait until the doer of the business is at leisure but the doer must follow up what he is doing and make the business his first object he must and if so we must infer that all things are produced more plentifully and easily and of a better quality when one man does one thing which is natural to him and does it at the right time and leaves other things undoubtedly 
then more than four citizens will be required, for the husbandman will not make his own plough or mattock or other implements of agriculture. So here, um, the point of this is to establish how many people are going to be in the city, but this concept that one person is going to be doing one thing that he does well is actually going to be very significant as they talk about the guardians and the readers of the city, and so we'll see that later. Keep that in mind. If they are to be good for anything. Neither will the builder make his tools, and he too needs many, and in like manner the weaver and the shoemaker. True. Then carpenters and smiths and many other artisans will be sharers in our little state, which is already beginning to grow. True. Yet even if we add neatherds, shepherds, and other herdsmen, in order that our husbandmen may have oxen to plough with, and builders as well as husbandmen may have draught cattle, and carriers and weavers, fleeces and hides, still our state will not be very large. Well, that is true, yet neither will it be a very small state which contains all these. Then again there is the situation of the city. To find a place where nothing need be imported is well nigh impossible. Impossible. Then there must be another class of citizens who will bring the required supply from another city. There must. But if the trader goes empty-handed, having nothing which they require who would supply his need, he will come back empty-handed. That is certain. And therefore, what they produce at home must... So this is just an explaining why there needs to be so many people in the city. Now we don't need it. We need to not only supply the needs of the people that are living in the city, but we need excess to trade with and get other stuff from other places. It must not be only enough for themselves but such both in quantity and quality as to accommodate those from whom their wants are supplied. Very true. Then more husbandmen and more artisans will be required. They will. Not to mention the importers and exporters, who are called merchants. Yes. Then we shall want merchants. We shall. And if merchandise is to be carried over the sea, Skilful sailors will also be needed, and in considerable numbers. Yes, in considerable numbers. Then, again, within the city, how will they exchange their productions? To secure such an exchange was, as you will remember, one of our principal objects when we formed them into a society and constituted a state. Clearly, they will buy and sell. Then they will need a marketplace and a money token for purposes of exchange. Certainly. Suppose now that a husbandman or an artisan brings some production to market, and he comes at a time when there is no one to exchange with him. Is he to leave his calling and set idle in the marketplace? Not at all. He will find people there who, seeing the want, undertake the office of salesmen. In well-ordered states, they are commonly those who are the weakest in bodily strength, and therefore of little use for any other purpose. Their duty is to be in the market, and to give money in exchange for goods to those who desire to sell, and to take money from those who desire to buy. This want, then, creates a class of retail traders in our state. Is not retailer the term which is applied to those who sit in the marketplace engaged in buying and selling, while those who wander from one city to another are called merchants? Yes, he said. And there is another class of servants who are intellectually hardly on the level of companionship. Still, they have plenty of bodily strength for labor, which accordingly they sell, and are called, if I do not mistake, hirelings, hire being the name which is given to the price of their labor. True. Then hirelings will help to make up our population? Yes. And now, Adamantus, is our state matured and perfected? I think so. Where, then, is justice? And where is injustice? And in what part of the state did they spring up? Probably in the dealings of these citizens with one another. I cannot imagine that they are more likely to be found anywhere else. I dare say that you are right in your suggestion, I said. We had better think the matter out, and not shrink from the inquiry. All right, so this is the first part of book two. They've built their state. Well, they've made the argument for why they need to do this. Um, Glaucon, Adamantius, have, or Adamantus, have shown us 
uh, these two individuals, this just person and this unjust person. And now Socrates has to figure out how the just person is actually happier than the unjust person. And the way they did this was they built this hypothetical state, and they're going to try to find where justice lives. And so they started this process, and it's going to be a long process, so uh, we'll see how the state continues to grow and where the leaders come in and the guardians and all these other things. So this is book two, part one, and stay tuned for book two, part two.